Welcome to Dying in Grace. This program is dedicated to educating our community about death, dying, and end-of-life care. And each week we bring someone from our community to enlighten us about their experience or their knowledge about death and dying. My name is Arlene Steputat, and if you want to learn a little bit about my own background with death and dying and how it shaped my experience, I invite you to go to our website, www.dyingingrace.com. There, uh, under the uh, About Me, you can watch a three-minute video a clip about my experience. You can also uh, enter a name in the Book of Living Love, and uh, you can watch uh, previous shows of Dying in Grace. If you're interested, you can also watch our shows on our YouTube channel, Dying in Grace. And you can follow us on Twitter at Dying in Grace. Tonight's show is really close to my heart because the purpose of this program is to get people to start talking about death and dying, to bring that taboo out of the closet, into the open, and have conversations. And tonight we have someone who's doing exactly that in this community. So I'd like to welcome Lynn Holzman. Hi. And um, Lynn runs the Death Cafe with some other colleagues. But first I wanted to ask you, Lynn, a little bit about you. Tell us about your background and how you would come to such a thing like this. Okay. Well, I'm a nurse and I went back into nursing after I'd raised my kids. And I was at Santa Barbara City College doing the refresher course. And nothing was really piquing my interest in, in all the different topics until I came to a couple of old VHS tapes on hospice. And then I was just insatiable with the topic. So it didn't really come from childhood experiences and all of that. It just more came from these uh, VHS tapes up there at City College. And I started reading a lot about death and dying and eventually went back to work as a nurse in hospice. And I also kind of like do-it-yourself stuff. So when I read about, well, I'm probably jumping ahead with the question. No, no. But I read about um, Death Cafe, I believe it was in Huffington Post. And I liked the idea of just regular people getting together to talk. I felt like working in hospice, I became more comfortable with the topic. And the people that I worked with there were. And then the patients and families became more comfortable over time. But in the general community, it really isn't talked about. So when I read about Death Cafe, I thought, oh, that just sounds like right up my alley. Well, I think it's really true. Um, having my own experiences working with different hospices, um, we also see what happens when people don't have any conversations about death and dying. Now, now they're dealing with it. So mm -hmm. there's the fear, there's guilt, there's all these unresolved questions, and people you know, really are like deer in the headlights. And so um, one of the purposes of Death Cafe, I think, is just to speak it, yeah. to speak your fears. So um, how did you find out about the Death Cafe? Well, like I said, the Huffington Post had an article, I believe it was the Huffington Post, had an article, and then I looked it up online, and I found the Death Cafe website, deathcafe.com. And it was so approachable. A person didn't need to have any special training, and I felt like it would be a good fit for me. So a friend of mine, Martha Sadler, and I started it in, about five years ago. Mm -hmm. And the tough part was finding a location, so we started in a restaurant, and we were supposed to all order a meal so that the restaurant got something out of it, too. Right. But people didn't really want to you know, spend a lot of money on food. So the next place we tried was the Creo Rec Center. And that cost me a lot of money. Ah, so oh, you paid for it yourself? I did. It was about $200. And so neither of those things worked. So that was a process to find where we are now. And um, because, well, one of the concepts of Death Cafe is that it needs to be free of charge. So I couldn't say, 
I didn't feel comfortable saying you have to buy a meal or you have to help me cover the $200. So. Well, I just really acknowledge your commitment to this vision that you would be willing to put $200 <laughs> out on an experiment. Yeah, it was. Uh -huh. So for people that are not familiar with the Death Cafe uh, concept, mm -hmm. can, you, can you tell us a little bit about how it got started and, and its founder and how you learned? Because like, you said it seemed really approachable. There's information there for people. Yeah. Well, uh, in Switzerland, a man named Bernard, and I don't know how to say his last name, um, Kretas, he started the first death cafes, and I believe that was in 2010. And I believe it was written up in a newspaper that then John Underwood saw, and he was in England. And it was John Underwood who took on the whole social movement and started the website where you can look up where there's a death cafe in your area. That's where I post mm -hmm. our upcoming dates. And um, you can learn there fascinating things about, oh, it's a discussion group. Mm -hmm. So in order to run a death cafe, you need to abide by four guidelines. I've already mentioned that it needs to be free of charge. The other thing is, is it's not support or therapy it's just a discussion group. It's a place to talk and discover and share thoughts. So, so we, it's not grief counseling. It's not there to say, I just got a terminal illness. I don't know what to do with this. You know, that's not its purpose. That's not its purpose. And it's very rare that we get a person like that. Right. I know that in the community there are more appropriate places for people like right. that. Right. Uh, so the other two things are that you have to offer something nourishing to eat and drink, which kind of offsets the you know s topic of death. You know, we we talk about um, living life to the fullest, and part of that is to eat and drink and be nourished. And the last thing is that it's confidential, so we don't talk about oh, so and so said this in the death or cafe. Or I saw you at the death cafe. I, I try not to say that, and sometimes I see people around town, and I try to be like a doctor and like oh, I recognize them, but I won't act like I do. So no, no. <laughs> right, so the confidential. Well, I think that gives people some courage to you know speak about it without feeling judged or you know what if or that type of thing. Um, I, I think, I, and I, I just want to tell our audience this, I've been there, I have been to the Death Cafe a number of times, and I don't know whether this was because you were following the British model, but tell people what you oh. serve and, and how lovely it is. Oh, thank you. That is one of my prides. <laughs> well, I took my grandmother and my husband's two grandmothers' teacups out of cardboard boxes, and I bring them to Death Cafe every time. So they used to just be stored for you know, I don't know what, a tea party with my daughter when she was little, but now they get, they're working and they get out every six weeks. And we've been going for five years, believe it or not, we've just had our fifth anniversary of Death Cafe Santa Barbara. And I've made peace with the fact that some of my cups will probably shatter, but not one has yet. Wow. Yes. Wow. So they're serving their purpose, <laughs> you know? I mean, there's something to be said about impermanence and, That's you know, right. do, you want, do you want to have the item be used for its purpose or do you want it to be pretty behind a glass that nobody touches, right? So if that's living, you're actually living life to the fullest by sharing that's and the true. heritage, right? Yeah. The heritage of the teacups, how beautiful that these teacups have meaning, you know? It's and true. I, I'll just say one time a woman walked in and she started to cry and I didn't know why. She picked up a teacup and she said it had been her mother's pattern. Oh. So that was, she thought, well, I'm in the right place. And she felt like her mother, a little bit of her mother was there with her well, in that teacup. There's something about that that makes it feel at least to me, it's not like your usual meeting out of a styrofoam yeah. or a paper cut. There's it's something true. special about it, and there's beauty that you bring to it, too, because each cup has its own beauty. You know, I know when I've gone, I really look at what's there and go, <laughs> oh, I want this one. Yeah, so, it's true. You know. I do that, too. And they're fragile, and yes. we are, too. Yes, that's a good point. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a reminder of our fragility. And then there's always some cakes or, yeah. or and and so I always make a just the same lemon poppy seed cake that I found online and another man used to come all the time regularly and he would always bring a particular cookie and he stopped coming but he shared his recipe with me so I always make his cookies too so it's just the two things oh but that's lovely it's mm -hmm. and there's also something 
uh, for those of us who go regularly, um, reassuring of the familiarity. Yeah. Oh, there's the pot, you know. I thought that too. You yeah. know, there's that, um, there's some safety in the familiarity of part of the ritual. And it, because mm -hmm. it is, ha it does sort of have a little ritual. I mean, just the t coming in, getting oh, yeah. your tea. So if I was someone listening to the show and I never went to a death cafe, what would I experience? You told me the four guidelines, but how does that actually work? Well, people come in, um, I'll say we usually get around 12 to 15 people. We've had as few as eight, we've had as many as 40. Wow. So it just depends on the week, and I'd say half of those are returning people, and we have regulars, and then about half are newcomers. So we sit down, and everybody shares just a minute, or I tell a little bit about Death Cafe, and then everybody shares a little something about themselves or, or what they're looking forward to maybe talking about. One time a woman wanted to talk about her mother. It was Mother's Day, so she, she mentioned t that topic. So anybody who wanted to be, you know, talk about that went with her. And then we just break into small groups, however that works out. We don't assign groups or call off numbers or anything. And those groups are fluid. If mm -hmm. uh, you want to get up and move to another group, you can. And we don't have topics, but we have people who are interested in talking. So some people are more listeners and some people are more talkers. And we try to, you know, not overburden the time with one person talking. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I just say you never know what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and usually, well, I work with Liz Bauer and Peggy um, Levine are my two co-leaders, and it usually works out where we'll separate out into the different groups. So there's usually one of us in one of the groups to, you know, I don't know, we don't really monitor anything, but if we needed to, we were there. Right, but it's, it, it, and I, you know, I've had that experience too. I haven't moved groups because I'm usually fascinated to see what the people in my group have to offer me, and, and I've had that experience, but there's something, in, and then, uh, as, as I recall, because I haven't been there in a while, uh, you pull everybody back together again. Is that accurate? Yeah. At the, well, we meet at the Hill Adobe, right. Hill Creo Adobe, <coughs> excuse me, and they need to shut down at 5 o'clock. So we start at 3.30 and we have to be out at exactly at 5. So we ring a little bell and we have to get all the teacups packed up and we do a little wrap up which is usually just, does anyone have anything to share about their experience or, yeah, so sometimes it's very informal, other times we sit down and, and share a little more. And um, yeah, I, I, the first time I had a death cafe, I put Kleenex out and I have to say, people think that there are going to be a lot of tears and often there are tears, but not, it, it's not the primary thing. I, I like sometimes I'll be in one group and then I'll hear, you know, just laughter come up from the other sections of the building because we get to meet in different parts. And so it isn't a big downer. Um, you know, people are talking about all kinds of loss or life, um, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. Well, I think that you know this from your own experience that there is even though someone is dying or there's a death has occurred, that doesn't mean all other aspects of life go out the window. So there, it, there can be something funny, there can mm -hmm. be humor, and I think in a way that's a gift that helps break the sadness, kind of mm -hmm. releases that. So um, I, I think that's really accurate. In my experience, people were talking about deaths, people were talking about just where society is, mm -hmm. people were talking about telling a friend they were going to the death cafe right. and the reaction that someone, what do you mean you're mm -hmm. going to the death cafe? So uh, you mentioned your partners and I wanted to, to mention that your partners with also, is it the Center for Successful Living? Um, aging. aging. And thank you for bringing that up because it, without them we wouldn't be able to meet in the Hill Carrillo Adobe, which is owned by the Santa Barbara Foundation, I believe. So they let nonprofits use their meeting spaces. I think it's actually the bank. Okay. <laughs> it's the bank. You okay. Mean bank space. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they let nonprofits and Death Cafe isn't a nonprofit, it's a worldwide thing. I don't I don't know what it is exactly, a social movement. So we didn't have a a number to give to prove that we were a nonprofit. So um, through my two colleagues, we get to, they, they work for the Center for Successful Aging. So we come under their umbrella. So then you're able to have that free so space, yes. which is a lovely space, you know, and uh, it has 
lots of nice little quiet spaces where you can convene to, yeah. to talk. So over the years, over these five years, what have you noticed? Have there been themes that come out? You've said there's some regulars. What, what touches you to keep you going? I mean, five mm -hmm. years is a long time mm -hmm. to be essentially volunteering to hold all this together. Mm -hmm. So what is it that you think feeds you it to feeds keep doing me. it? Well, um, well, I think it's just serving a really good purpose and I get, um, I feel good when I see people really talking and helping each other and I don't know if outside friendships have formed but a little bit of that is happening. People um, really care about each other, especially the ones who keep coming back obviously. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and uh, just knowing people over the years too, knowing people who are interested in similar topics to myself and um, yeah, what keeps me coming back, it's satisfying. I, mm -hmm. I find it. I find it satisfying. I'm proud of it. I'm proud to be part of it. And and well, you should be. Thank um, you. Now you mentioned that you you post our, our meetings on the Death Cafe website, mm -hmm. and in looking at that website, they also have other resources, uh, just some simple things there. But uh, tell us about this national movement. Do you, do you have a sense of how in, it's not just in London and no. the United States? It's it's spread pretty internationally at this it is. point. Is, isn't that accurate? Yeah, I did look at the website because they have a map there where you can see the little pins where they've happened. And so I know that it's, Death Cafe has happened in 56 countries. Wow. And there have been over 6,000 Death Cafe meetings. And I, I believe we're the only one, I know Hospice of Santa Barbara does death and cupcakes on a sort of noontime thing. Mm -hmm. um, but we have had people come from Lompoc and Santa Maria. No kidding, wow. San Luis Obispo, Ventura, Ojai, LA. And a woman was just up from Mexico saying she wanted to come because she wants to start one there. And then we get people from out of town who are just visiting and they want to see what it's like or they've been to them back in Massachusetts and they want to see what the Santa Barbara one is like. I've never been to another one. Uh -huh. So it's always, I'm always curious to see, you know, how people respond and they say, oh yeah, it's just like the one in Massachusetts or whatever. So, wow. yeah. So I find it interesting that this, we have the Santa Barbara one and are you aware what's the next closest one geographically? Um, Do you know? Is there, there's not one in Los Angeles? Well, I don't know if it's going as strong as ours. That's uh -huh. the thing, we've had the staying power. And people say, oh, start one in Ventura. And I say, well, you can start one in Ventura. Or one time somebody said, I wish it was at you know, six o'clock, because unfortunately now it's during working hours. Right. That's because of the Hill Creo Adobe hours. Um, and I just say, you can start one. There's, you know, we don't have a corner on the market. Anybody can do it, so. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's exciting to me um, that this trend is happening worldwide because as, you know, those of us have worked in the field and I think a lot of people are realizing the, what our current norms are, especially in Western culture, isn't serving us at mm -hmm. all about death and dying. And with all the stuff, whether it's the random shootings or it's our loved one with a terminal illness, we have to really start to prepare, to have conversations. and to change the trending and the dialogues with doctors, all that is, is really starting to happen. And I mentioned to you uh, that I, I'm aware of a new movement called the Dinner Party that a friend of mine told me about uh, that started, I believe, in Los Angeles, and it's millennials mm -hmm. doing a real dinner party, so it's a potluck dinner party, but they are talking about how death has impacted them, whether what they lost their parent at a younger age, whether their mom just passed or a sibling died. And what's interesting is they want to keep it to their generation. Mm -hmm. And there's something magic about 20s and 30 year olds saying, we, we got to start doing mm -hmm, something here. So it's, it's pretty phenomenal that something's lifting around death it's and dying true. worldwide and um, you know it's pretty extraordinary that you have kept that commitment so you say you know ours is going strong and I just want to say ours is going strong because five years later you're still there oh, thank you and, and I think that it takes that kind of 
leadership and mm -hmm. visionary. Um, so um, do you ever get family members to come uh, to the meeting? Like does somebody come once and then bring a spouse or a sister or something? And I think you had some experiences with that on your own level. I want to keep the confidentiality, <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, um, sometimes it seems like uh, one person will come and then they bring along a family member or friend who's maybe less enthusiastic, but they do it. But I'd say the the regulars are not pairs of people necessarily. Uh -huh. They tend to be, um, you know, whichever person has more interest. Uh, yeah. And I have not gotten my husband to come. No. <laughs> um, um, well, I believe you did have a family member yes, come. Yes, yes, my daughter came. And sometimes we get people in their 20s. And uh, the time that she came, I think there was another young person there. We tend to be older women who show up, or middle-aged to older, and uh, yeah, a couple men, usually one or two mm -hmm. men in the group, but yeah, more women, and yeah, I, I think there's more place for this. I think that this conversation should, I don't know if it can be in public schools just because it's a little bit touchy, but I think that the concept and the topic of death should start much younger and then I think oh well nursing homes already talk about it but then the older people who've come they say oh no no they do not yeah so then I think oh if I you know maybe I should be a traveling death cafe you know bring my teacups and go to different nursing homes and just set up a table and see what happens but well that's <laughs> a really unique idea and I think in, in my own experiences in nursing homes where you would think oh of course people will talk mm -hmm. about it what I, I know, um, based on people I know who are residents there and also staff people there, that when there's a death of a resident, it's almost like they don't even talk about it, mm. you know, as if um, it's almost superstitious. Mm -hmm. If we mention that so-and-so died, then it's going to bring it on. Yeah. And, and your point to talking to children, I, I think there is more awareness that children are smart enough to understand that and when they're first goldfish dies mm -hmm. or their puppy dies, you know, something, ha I mean, there's appropriate discussions. Mm -hmm. and, and Lord knows with the, um, the violence and the shootings mm -hmm. in schools, yeah. the, the conversations are being forced on children, whether they're ready that's or not, mm -hmm. you know. So I think, again, that's what we're both about is, mm -hmm. is, is that kind of um, shifting. So do you see any changes in the Santa Barbara community as a result of five years later? Do you, do you, do you see anything <clears throat> changing because there's conversation? Well, I don't know about Santa Barbara in particular, but I have, or maybe it's just on my radar, I see more articles in newspapers, more books written um, about death and dying from the doctor's perspective, mm -hmm. you know, breath becomes air, things like that. Right. So many interesting books, not just nursing books, right. not just nursing videos that I happen to be able to watch. I think that's part of it. I think you hit on something there, is uh, taking the mystery out of it, mm -hmm. um, taking it out. It, you know, it's in the hospital and, and the morgue and the funeral home, but it really is a topic for just all of us and we're not in touch with death anymore because we've professionalized it. And right, it happened someplace else. Yeah, and so this is a way of, yeah, talking about it, normalizing it, and maybe getting a little bit more in touch with it. And, and people share their stories, and sometimes people talk about, you know, intimate things that happened and the death of someone, and we all learn from that, from hearing other people's stories. And you know, one of the things I think that you provide is a space for people to tell their stories about a death they experienced, mm -hmm. whether it was something that was hurtful, something that was beautiful, something that's just on their mind, a happy remembrance mm -hmm. after the fact. And there are f very few places where you're allowed to grieve, yeah. where you're allowed to have those discussions. Uh, people will shut you down very quickly mm -hmm. it's, it, because there's this kind of group collusion. We're all mm -hmm. uncomfortable, so please don't, please mm -hmm. don't bring up the D word, you mm -hmm. know. It's kind of the uh, Woody Allen mm -hmm. adage, you know, it's not that I'm afraid of death, I just don't want to be there when it happens, you know, that's <laughs> kind of what he says. Well, um, well, and also along those lines, it's not that 
myself and my colleagues are any more comfortable or know anything more or are more set in our beliefs. It's just such a mystery and we just come to it with that sense of mystery and interest. So, so uh, if people wanted to, to find out more about our Death Cafe like the next days, can you tell them the website is just deathcafe.com? Yes. And then, then you can do a search for Santa Barbara, mm -hmm. is that how it goes? Okay. Yes. And then you post information? I do. I put the invitation and a new thing is at the bottom of the invitation we put all our dates for the rest of the calendar year because meeting at the Curio Adobe we get a year's schedule ahead of time so we know all the dates for, oh, the, for so 2018. Oh, so then people can plan. Yeah, so they right. can plan. I also post it in the Independent and on Ed Hat and Newshawk. So you're really making it available to people. So for, for um, people that are um, maybe listening to this and kind of thinking, oh, should I, shouldn't I, what, what, what can you say to them that would make them feel comfortable coming? What, what would be, you know, if, if I was having coffee and saying, I don't know, Lynn, <laughs> I'd sort of like to go, but I'm not sure. What could you tell me that would invite me? to feel more comfortable about it. Well, one thing right off the bat, which I think kind of is a hindrance for people, is I used to have RSVP on there, and I've taken that away because it really doesn't matter how many show up. Uh -huh. And then I was getting people who would RSVP and then feel bad and be trying to call me you know, an hour before, oh, I can't come after all, and that, all that just doesn't matter. So I would say if the mood hits, you just come. And then other people will just come in and just say, I just want to check it out. And we say, fine, you don't have to stay the whole time. You don't need to be excused or whatever. So I think that they're pleasantly surprised. I think that it's, it feels very friendly and informal. It, it, so people aren't really looking at you. And, and some people will say, I'm not going to talk really this time. I just want to listen my first time. A lot of times people will say that. And uh, people are warm and friendly. Well, so. <laughs> Lynn, that, that's great, and I, I really appreciate uh, you coming to tell us about the Death Cafe. Well, thank um, you for inviting me. I'm going to ask you to sign uh, if there's a name in the Book of Living Love that you would like to. Would oh, you yes. please do thank that? You. And I would like to thank Lynn, our guest. I'd like to thank TVSB and our crew, Elliot and Michael, for once again helping us run this beautiful show. May you live each day to the fullest.